Hello everyone, welcome back to the channel. Thank you so much for joining me today for part two of my interview with Karen Thomas. If you missed part one, I will link it in the description. It's where we learned all about Karen's profound and in-depth near-death experience. And today we're going to dive into a Q&A in which I asked her all about her journey from fundamentalist Christianity to her near-death experience and what her views are now on religion and Jesus Christ, just for starters. Before we start, I just want to mention that the links to Karen's other interviews will also be in the description. She's been interviewed by the Jeff Mara podcast, Sylvia's Spiritual Show, NDE Radio, and We Don't Die Radio. She also appeared in the documentary Back from the Light. I'd love to ask you about um, your upbringing, you said that you were raised or you attended a fundamentalist church before your experience. And um, I'm curious now, what has your journey been like? Um, and what are your thoughts on religion? Um, that was a long journey. <laughs> when I first, um, when I first came back to church, after my experience, um, I really had a, a, a tough time because I had been completely filled with what, what I knew and I felt was no judgment, um, nothing but unconditional love and acceptance when I was going through my near-death ex experience life review. Mm -hmm. And so when I would be back in church and when there would be um, sermons about, um, well, the sheep and the goat are separated and some will may be accepted and some will not. And um, only if uh, you believe in, in salvation and, and believe in Jesus, will you be in heaven? And I knew this, well, I felt strongly that some of my family members that I saw who were deceased um, had not been fundamentalist they had not been quote unquote born again and yet they were there and I just knew in my heart that that judgment that ex exclusiveness rather than inclusiveness was not what I was feeling I was feeling this total unconditional love of God and that God was this entire light of everything that was there on the other side. And I wasn't judged. I wasn't judged. I was given my free will. And my free will wasn't being um, given to me in the sense of, well, if, if you do this, then you'll be loved enough and you'll be forgiven and you'll be, it was just, this is what happens. And you are loved. And and behaving kindly and with compassion is just simply how other people are able to gain that from you and will live so much more peacefully and happily in your life um, and in theirs. So, so it clashed. It clashed a lot. And I finally reached a point where um, I ended up saying I can't be a part of this anymore and I have to study about spirituality and exactly what I experienced in and where I belong, what I believe now. Mm -hmm. And so stopped attending church, which was tough because my husband and his family members were very, very attached to the church. And um, they continued, you know, to be to feel that way. And that was fine with me. It's just a, I couldn't be there until I got over this feeling of, you know, that this is just wrong. Mm -hmm. um, and over the years, you know, it, it's changed a lot. You know, um, I've come to the point now where I realize that everybody has their own individual path, spiritual path that they're walking here on earth. And some people um, are very, very supported by the structure 
that religion gives them, whatever their religion might be. And it helps them to learn about acting with kindness and compassion toward others. And so for them, it, it's very positive for them. And for me, um, I, I just do what I feel brings me closer to God and increases my own spirituality and do my best to love, get that unconditional love out to others. Wow. I really love what you said there. And I'm pretty involved in the deconstructing Christian community. And there can just be so much like reaction, reaction to what you were raised with and just, which is understandable because a lot of people were traumatized or hurt by religion in some way. But I love what you said there about understanding that it can be beneficial for some people mm -hmm. and everybody is following the path that's meant for them. This can be definitely be a polarizing question. So I want to preface it by saying that there's no right or wrong answer that I'm digging for here, but I'm just curious your thoughts since you were raised Christian, um, what are your thoughts now on Jesus? That's interesting that you do ask that because part of what I went through in my own spiritual discovery, um, I, I literally attended a course that was called Education for Ministry. And it was within the church. Um, however, it was a very, I guess you could say, open um, church atmosphere. And it was a that during that four year time, I studied the Old Testament, mm -hmm. the New Testament, the early Christian church, and then other world religions and philosophies. And it was a whole overall picture. And during that time, what I learned was that a lot of Christianity um, was developed so long after Jesus's actual ministry mm -hmm. that it was interpreted by the people of that time. And they were basing it because they had initially, most of them been um, of the Jewish faith, Judaism. They were trying to fit that square peg of what Jesus taught them into the round hole of what Judaism had taught them. And so there was a, a lot of conflict within the early church members. Some felt that to be a Christian, you would have to become a Jew first. You'd have to be circumcised if you were male. You would have to only eat kosher foods. You would have, and then other early Christians felt no. Um, Jesus, you know, had told us take the good news to everyone, to the whole world, and. So we don't feel that they need to do that. So essentially man's own interpretations and restrictions and things began to be built into the whole system that ultimately became the Christianity that we know now. Um, but I had this ability when I came back from my near-death experience to when I studied the Bible to be able to just have this gut feeling of, Oh, yeah, yes, that is what Jesus taught right there when he said this in the Sermon on the Mount. But then when I would read something else in the in the Bible, and it would say, you know, you know, you would be sent to hell or like Lazarus, the, the story of Lazarus, the who ended up being in heaven, but the rich man who had been cruel to him, couldn't even get a, a drop of water and things like that. When I would read those segments, I'd think, no, no, that's not what Jesus taught. That wasn't his message. So I felt like there was a huge difference between a lot of the um, interpretations that came along so much later and what Jesus really was teaching when he was here. I learned through meditation too, um, that I was able in meditation to reconnect with my spirit guide that had been with me when I was on the other side. And so I, I would learn, I would hear through my meditation, different ways of looking at what had been um, in the Bible and what had been part of the church that I had been in before and understand why 
this particular thing was incorrect and this other thing was correct. So I guess what I ended up coming to feel is that a lot of people who get off base, it's because they're worshiping the book. They're not worshiping Jesus. And the book isn't infallible. And it does have a lot of parts that were, you know, just simply interpretations that were kept in the book. Um, and there were a lot of other interpretations that were thrown out um, because the Bible that we ended up with ultimately um, was decided on really pretty much in a political fashion um, of what would be allowed to remain and what would be tossed apart. That was so good. Thank you so much for sharing that. I agree with you. You've mentioned a couple of times how there was no judgment on the other side. And um, I remember hearing in one of your other interviews that you said you were really beating yourself up during your life review, thinking why well, I could have done better there. Or I could have done this differently. And, and how did the beings that were with you respond to that? Um, they responded completely lovingly and, and in full acceptance and said, you are on earth to experience these things and to to learn to feel love and compassion. And you can't, if everything is, is perfect and you never have any sort of difficult times or situations where you, you are tested, then you're not going to be able to, to feel as, as much love and compassion as, as we would like to have you grow to feel. So all of that kind of came through and it was, Although I was wanting to judge me, none of them were wanting to judge me in any way. And we're saying, no, no, this is okay. This is part of what happens and part of what's supposed to happen. Mm -hmm. And, and look how you're feeling now and how much, how much better you understand. You know, so that was, that was essentially it. And do you think that that's, non-judgment extends to everybody else, maybe even people who have done um, what we would consider to be horrible things in this life? Um, yes, I do. And again, that has grown out of my own studies um, and what I've learned. Uh, one of the things that probably also doesn't match with what many people feel is that I, I have grown to feel that reincarnation is part of our whole process as well. And that, as I said, when I felt like those people that were there in the room had helped me plan my life, um, well, that was this life. And there were, I believe, certain things that I very much wanted to encounter spiritually in order to grow more in this lifetime. And so they helped me in deciding what those particular challenges or experiences might be. And so I think that's the same with people who, who have done really horrible, cruel things in a lifetime. Um, they certainly have to learn going forward about how horrible and painful those things are mm -hmm. for others around them. But then they also can be part of a hard experience that someone else that they are a soul group with wanted to encounter and to be able mm -hmm. to have a chance to grow through. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's pretty complicated, but I, I it makes sense. And it's not literally, it's not judgment, it's spiritual growth. It's beautiful. You mentioned that you saw that there was light within the plants and the trees and um, everything that was um, just sort of giving it its life. And I've come to think over the years of reading near-death experiences and some of my own spiritual experiences that that light is actually here sustaining this world too, even though we can't sense it. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I agree. 
um, I think that light is um, is actually part of God, a part of our our Creator, that is within everything that God has created, and so each of us have a bit of that light within us. And although here, when we look at someone else that we encounter, we don't necessarily see that light like I saw it emanating from everything that I saw on the other side, it is still, it is that element of life. And it is that spirit that is our total unique self. And one of the things I've come to believe too, is that the, one of the reasons why I was able to fully remember my experience, even when I was in that recovery room in the hospital. But at the same time, I was, my brain consciousness was muddled and couldn't even remember what had happened to me in the surgery. I think that's because that light within me is the consciousness and the self that is eternal. And that the consciousness that our brain interacts with is a totally different consciousness and that we have within us both kinds. And so we always have that spiritual consciousness as the light within us, while we also have a human and brain consciousness that operates through our, our brain. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's kind of hard to put into, into words, but it is that, um, that that light, that spirit that's the eternal consciousness um, is what we ultimately are eternally. Well, you did a really great job of putting that into words, I think. What do you think is, and you probably sort of answered this already, but what do you think is the purpose of this life and why do we choose to plan these lives and come here? I think the purpose of it is ultimately growing um, spiritually. Um, and by growing spiritually, I mean becoming closer and closer to our creator's ultimate unconditional love um, that has has been what has created everything that he's created. I say he is, you know, at, as giving a pronoun, <laughs> but, and, and so in order to get that total, reach that point of that total unconditional love and compassion, there's multiple, multiple different experiences that we need to come at from all different directions in order to be able to grow fully into that. Mm -hmm. And finally, what do you think is the best way for people to connect with the creator or with the divine light you were talking about here in this world? Well, um, there are a lot of different ways, I guess, you know, and I think each of us kind of has a path that we feel more uniquely uh, drawn to. Uh, for me, it has been meditation. Um, I, I feel that, you know, meditation and, um, and also just some of the spirituality that you can find within organizations, you know, like sometimes within church or sometimes within, um, say, a yogi or, or another type of practice that you you can follow that helps you to tune into yourself and to within tune into God within you. Um, it doesn't have to be specific, but I do, at least for me, meditation has been the biggest answer. Thank you so much. Um, is there anything you, any way that people can get in touch with you or anything else that you'd like to share? Um, yeah, I generally like to just leave my email address. And my email address um, is B-L-A-N-C-E-T-H at L-I-V-E dot com. And I, I just say to people, if you are going to contact me that way, in the subject line of your email, I need you to say, 
something about having seen my, a near-death experience interview of mine or having a question about um, near-death experience and spirituality, something that I know it's someone who has seen an interview. And, um, and then I, you know, depending on what their question or concern is, you know, I'll try to help them individually. Okay. Karen, okay. thank you. Thank you so much. I feel so blessed to have been able to have this conversation with you. Thank you for sharing your story and your wisdom with us. Oh, you're very welcome. I'm glad I had an opportunity to talk with you too.